inviting me. It's a great honor. Um, so you might notice that the title is different from the one I originally gave. Um, I was initially going to speak about some uh, developments which occurred about two years ago. Uh, but then I decided that uh, our field is uh, moving so fast that this is really ancient history by now. Um, and decided to talk about something uh, which is happening now, as you can you know, tell from the archive numbers. Um, so, so this is a field uh, that I'm very excited about. Um, so there seem to be some... Uh, rather unexpected connections between, um, between a quantum hole fluid at a filling factor one half, you know, in a conventional uh, two-dimensional electron gas, uh, and uh, surface states of uh, three plus one dimensional um, um, topological phases. Now, uh, here are some references um, on the um, quantum hole side. Uh, really, the breakthrough was made uh, in this paper by Dam Son and also related work by uh, Mason Barkeshley and company. And uh, on the uh, topological insulator superconductor side, uh, the progress was made in these uh, two papers. And uh, just, uh, I think, last week, uh, there was a paper by uh, Chong Wang and uh, Sentel, which uh, gives a kind of uh, review and um, syn synthesis of these prior works. So that might be a useful, useful reference. OK, so um, let me begin with the quantum hole uh, part. So um, you know, let's just take uh, two-dimensional um, non-relativistic electrons spin polarized in a strong magnetic field. B. And we know that we'll get uh, Landau levels. Separated by the cyclotron frequency, Eb over M. Um, and each one of these Landau levels you know, on a finite system, say a torus, has n phi states, with n phi being a magnetic field times uh, the area of the system over 2 pi. And uh, let me imagine that this, you know, that the filling, that the number of electrons is such that it's enough to exactly half fill the lowest Landau level, nu equal 1 half. So an electron over n fluxes, which is nu, is equal to one half. And let me ask what happens. Well, you know, before before I do any theory, let me just look at experiments. So here are our uh, beloved uh, quantum hole traces. You know, the hole conductivity going going up, and then below the uh, longitudinal. Uh, longitudinal resistivity, and uh, you know we are trained to look for plateaus in this data. Uh, you know plateaus correspond to this quantized hole conductance, this uh, fractional quantum, integer and fractional quantum hole states. Uh, but if you look, uh, if you look at uh, nu equal one half, which should correspond to a uh, hole resistivity of two, you know sigma x y equal one half should be hole resistivity of 2, uh, we see that the data is pretty smooth in the whole uh, signal. There is no plateau. And then if you look uh, in the longitudinal um, resistivity, there is, no, uh, there is no zero. right? There is some shallow dip <laughs> here. But this dip, as you lower the temperature, doesn't uh, develop into a, a zero like the uh, plateau states do. So you see that this dip, this one half dip, is though surrounded by um, some oscillations. And those oscillations in the uh, longitudinal resistivity, as you lower the ter temperature, develop into the fractional quantum hole states. Uh, with whole, so, so, so they develop into these plateaus with, you know, there is like, s with whole conductivity 6 13s, 5 11s, 4 9s, you know, 
three sevenths to fifth one third eventually, and on the other side as well. So you get, you know, surrounding this shallow minimum at one half, you get honest to God uh, as you lower the temperature, you get honest to God uh, plateau states with whole conductances of the form p over two p plus one and on one side and on the other side p plus one over two p plus one with p being uh, an integer. Uh, and this is the famous, that, that's the famous Jain, Jain sequence and then we see that this Jain sequence somehow, somehow encroaches on the, on the one half. So, so let, me, let me just uh, give you a zoom in of this picture. Um, okay, so again, that's one half. The whole signal is smooth. Nothing exciting happening. The longitudinal signal is, again, pretty smooth. You know, maybe some dip. Um, so, you know, just from, from this resistivity data, it doesn't look like there is anything particularly exciting going on around one half. So why bother? Well, it turns out that that's misleading. It turns out that this uh, state at one half is, is strongly suspected to be uh, an extremely interesting exotic state with uh, fractional excitations and emergent gauge fields. And in my opinion, that's probably the most interesting state that has been discovered uh, in nature experimentally so far. Um, OK, so let me tell you uh, about the theory of this state. Uh, the theory is, does this move? Oh, can I, is this fixed? I guess it's fixed. Um, the theory is due to um, Halpin, Lee, and Reed, and goes back to So this state at a new equal one half is known as the composite uh, Fermion liquid. Its theory is due to Halpern, Lee, and Reed, and goes back to 93, really ancient times. Um, OK, uh, so, so what do we have again? We have this Landau levels with the one of the Landau levels for definiteness, say the lowest one half filled. Um, one half. Um, okay, so so what is the Hamiltonian of this problem? Um, well, it's just you know non-relativistic electrons with Coulomb interactions, and let me write that Hamiltonian. Um, it's convenient to write it first in first quantized notation. So there is a sum of particles, i from 1 to n, gradient acting with respect to particle on i coordinates, minus kinetic energy. interaction energy, and you can take any, your, your favorite interaction potential, you know, for definiteness, let's maybe take V of R. Let's take the Coulomb potential. Okay, uh, so how do we, uh, how do we attack, attack this problem? Um, so, you know, if you forget the interactions, and uh, the lowest Landau level is half filled, you know, there is a huge degeneracy because you know, the kinetic energy is completely quenched by the magnetic field. So how, you know, they'll, you know, instead of sitting here, some of the electrons can sit here. So there is uh, exponential degeneracy. And we want to understand how the interactions split that degeneracy. Um, so, okay, so it looks like an Im impenetrable problem. But uh, so there is the following, there is the following um, trick which is, uh, you know, let's take our wave function for electrons. This is the electron wave function. You know, it's a 
anti-symmetric wave function in the coordinates of the particles. And uh, let's write it, let's just uh, make a transformation. Let's write it in the following form. Product J. By the way, let me warn you that uh, the first uh, maybe 15 minutes of the talk will be uh, rather technical, but uh, the technical level will drop after that exponentially. So, so just hang on. Um, OK, so we're going to uh, take our electron wave function, and we are going to rewrite it in this form, where we just multiply it by this phase factor out front. And in this phase factor, zi and zj are just complex coordinates of the particles. So let's say zj is xj plus iyj. Remember, we are working in 2D. Um, OK, so I just took my wave function uh, and uh, I rewrote it as some phase times another wave function. Now notice that this phase is uh, symmetric under interchanging z two, two coordinates, xi and xj, zi and zj, because of the square here. So if this is an anti-symmetric wave function, then this is also an anti-symmetric wave function. So I can think, therefore, of this wave function here, psi cf, as a wave function of fermions. And I'll refer to those fermions as composite fermions. And those will be the important degrees of freedom um, in this problem. Now, uh, OK, so physically, what is this phase factor out here? So imagine. I fix the position of one of the particles, say Z1, and uh, I take another particle, say Z2, and I let Z2 go around Z1. Then uh, Z2 picks up a phase 4 pi when going around Z1. And similarly, if I take any other particle, Z3, Z4, if it goes around Z1, it picks up phase 4 pi. So it looks like Z1 has a vortex attached to it. So I've attached a vortex, a vortex to each one of my electrons. So I should really be thinking of these composite fermions as differing from an usual electron by a double vortex. Flux 4 pi or, you know, in real units, 2hc over e vortex. 2h over e. OK, very good. So uh, with this transformation, let's just look how, um, how to rewrite the Hamiltonian in terms of this new wave function. So notice that if I have gradient acting on psi e, So if I just act with gradient on this, it can act either on this term or this term. OK. Acting on this term is easy. Acting on this term is also not too hard. It gives this the following factor. Bigger? OK.
Right, so when I differentiate this whole mass, there is an extra term coming from differentiating this, which is given by this expression here, where theta hat, theta hat of x is just the azimutal direction. It's just minus y x over square root of x squared plus y squared. OK, so let me, let me just take this term. <laughs> And let me call it A of xi, where I define, I simply define A of x to be the following expression. Well, two. x is just given by this expression. Uh, I'm cheating a little bit with respect to this j not equal to i term, but please forgive me for that. It's not, it's a, just a technical difficulty. It's not a physical, there is not a lot of physical uh, significance to that. Okay, um, so my derivative on the electron wave function has kind of turned into a covariant derivative on this composite Fermi wave function with a gauge field A. And this gauge field here satisfies the following, um, the following property that if I take the curl of this gauge field at point x, it is equal to 2 times 2 pi times sum over j of delta function. So, xj, remember, are just the coordinates of the electrons. So um, basically, this gauge field A, you know, if these are my electrons sitting in the plane, then the gauge field A has flux. <coughs> so there is a delta function with two flux quanta. attached, you know, each electron sources, sources flux to pi of this gauge field. Okay? All right. So then if I take this Hamiltonian and I rewrite it in terms of a uh, Composite fermions, in terms of psi composite fermion, I get a new Hamiltonian transformed Hamiltonian H composite fermion acting on the composite fermion wave function uh, with H composite fermion being given by Questions? Yes? Yeah, is that a, a Q? Uh, the second two number parentheses? Yeah. This, that's an A. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, good. So, what have we done? We've rewritten our original problem 
in terms of this wave function psi composite fermion. And now, you know, in addition to what we had, we also get this gauge field little a. And this gauge field little a is slaved to the positions of my particles. Um, so, so really, I, it looks like I've made my problem more complicated. You know, not only do I have a bunch, uh, bunch of fermions and fermions with some kinetic term and interaction term, but I also have now this gauge field and I have to consistently solve the constraint that this gauge field is determined by the particle positions. Yes? Have you, have you assumed that the form of B has changed from what it was when you had H of just the electron? No, no, no. Because uh, observe that the uh, electron wave function and the composite fermion wave function only differ by a phase factor, and that phase factor just goes through. So in particular, the density so this expression here is the density of electrons, right? This delta function at each electron position, rho e of x, but that's same as the density of composite fermions because the absolute value squared of the electron wave function is the same as the absolute value squared of the composite fermion wave function. Okay. Um, good. So it looks like so every time I create an electron, because of this constraint, I also have to create two flux quanta of the gauge field little a and a composite fermion. So then I can think of the electron as a composite fermion. plus two flux quanta of A, flux for pi. So again, you know, this, this kind of agrees with the original intuition I was giving that, you know, an electron is a composite fermion plus a double vortex attached to it. All right, um, so why did we do this crazy transformation? Why does it uh, simplify life? Well, um, let's not worry too much about this, uh, this constraint uh, on the gauge field. Uh, let's just, you know, so, so this is constraint at each point in space, but let's just do some mean field approximation. Let's treat this constraint on average. Let's just, let's just, demand that on average curl cross A is equal to the average composite fermion density which is the same as the average electron density. Right? So then A just becomes some uniform magnetic field determined by the density. So now my electrons experience two uh, sources of magnetic field. One is the original magnetic field and the other is the, this magnetic field of little a. And the magnetic field of little a is determined by electron density. So the overall magnetic field seen by the composite fermions is equal to the physical magnetic field B due to a minus four pi rho e bar. Now, when the Landau level is exactly half filled, you can check that this expression is equal to zero. So when the Landau level is exactly half filled, the composite fermions on average see no magnetic field. On average, or in this mean field approximation, this term is zero. So then, okay, if you have fermions, now in this case composite fermions, sitting in no magnetic field, what do they do? Well, they just form Fermi surfaces, right? They will form a Fermi surface corresponding to this p squared over 2m dispersion.
So, we expect that at half filling, the composite fermions fill up a Fermi surface with a radius kf. Well, kf should be determined by the number of composite fermions. So, pi kf squared over 2 pi squared should be equal to the density of composite fermions. But remember, as I have discussed, the composite fermion density is the same as the electron density. Remember, we had this rho composite fermion of x is electron density of x, because the two-wave functions differ only by phase factor. And this is also slave to be 2 times 2 pi, um, 1 over 2 times 2 pi. Let's keep this, the flux. OK, so it's set uh, the volume of the composite fermion Fermi surface is set by the uh, composite fermion density, which is the same as the electron density, which is the same as magnetic field over 4 pi at equal 1 half. So we have something really remarkable happening. We started with a system of electrons in a very strong magnetic field where all the kinetic energy was completely quenched. And then, as a result of interactions, we are guessing that, yes? That will be the topic of my talk. <laughs> um, let me answer that later. Um, yes, so we, we see that um, in this very strong magnetic field, as a result of electron-electron interactions, we have emergent, new emergent uh, fermions, composite fermions, which form a Fermi surface, which have kinetic energy and which form a Fermi surface. So that's, yes? So you could have done this whole thing without even having that P. So how can you say that this is definitely an interaction? Good. It's a guess. It's a guess. Uh, so, you know, it's, a, it's some mean field treatment. And uh, at the end of the day, we have to just check this mean field treatment against numerics and against experiments. And we, we can Im improve on the mean field treatment by you know, including fluctuations, in particular fluctuations of this gauge field little a. Um, so we, we build and you know, we have a fairly complete theory of this state, at least for Coulomb interactions between electrons, low energy theory, and then we just match with numerics and experiments. Good, good. So um, in this treatment, the physical electron density, which is an observable, is the same as the composite fermion density and is the same as the flux of this gauge field little a. So far, I fixed you know, this flux to be non-fluctuating, but I can later include fluctuations. Um, so that's you know, one observable is just density density correlation function. And that observable is actually measured uh, by surface acoustic wave uh, experiments. And those experiments indeed give direct evidence for the presen presence of this composite fermion Fermi surface. Um, there, are other, there are other experiments that confirm the presence of this Fermi surface. For instance, geometric, um, geometric resonance experiments. So we have very good experimental evidence that at nu equal 1 half, indeed, one has this Fermi surface of composite fermions present. Uh, moreover, as you deviate from nu equal one half, um, let's see. Let's imagine that B is not exactly equal to four pi times the electron density times the average electron density. Then the effective then, then there will be a small effective magnetic field seen by the composite fermions, much smaller than the initial magnetic field you applied, 
but, uh, but still uh, non-zero. So when mu is not equal to one half, well, what do electrons, what do fermions do in a magnetic field? They form Landau levels. So now, you know, if we are not exactly at mu equal one half, the composite fermions form Landau levels themselves in this effective field B effective. You know, let me call this M equal one, etc. And well, we can imagine a situation when, say, P of these Landau levels are filled. And it turns out that in this situation, what this corresponds to is a, so you have here whole conductivity of composite fermions is equal to P, because there are just, it's just integer quantum Hall effect for composite fermions with P Landau levels filled. But it turns out that this translates into a whole conductivity for electrons, which is given by P over 2P plus 1. So integer quantum Hall effect of composite fermions translates into fractional quantum Hall effect of electrons at the precisely at the famous Jane sequence. Yes? So uh, you can change the phase factor, say the exponent over the I minus the J, the J, and you can have another set of theories with zero effective magnetic field for new not equal to half. And then you have another set of Indeed, indeed. So, for instance, one quarter. So, if, if you, so, the, so the exponent has to be even if you want to get fermions. If the composite objects are fermions, you have to attach an even number of flux quanta. And so, for instance, at one quarter, or, and you should get similar similar state. And in fact, in fact, it is seen. So here. Um, That's right. So you can also think of, say, one third using this composite boson picture. And, and then it's just a superfluid of composite bosons. That's correct. So, so you, you were saying it's just a guess, but in some sense, most of physics is just a guess. And we call it adiabatic continuity, but it's, it's, it's the statement that if you have a problem you can solve, then often there are lots of other problems that are much more complicated that look like the problem you can solve because you can sort of pin, you can you can uh, you can treat all the corrections as 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 perturbations. So here it's a little bit worse than that because there is no problem that we can really honestly solve. I thought the Fermi liquid, if in the mean field limit, at, at, the Fermi liquid, and then everything else is just little corrections on the Fermi liquid. But microscopically, we cannot solve it, right? Microscopically, we cannot show that, you know, given a Coulomb interaction, the half filled Landau level becomes this composite no, no, Fermi no. liquid. Yes, yes. You're, you're absolutely right. You, you have to, uh, but, 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 uh, but it's, it's a guess, but not a surprise that works. Uh, that, that, <laughs> somehow, that somehow it's close to a Fermi liquid. But there's no continuous path that takes you from one to the other. I'm not clear. From, from you, you could imagine uh, uh, um, um, uh, pinning the flux speed to the fermions and then slowly letting the the uh, flux tubes uh, spread out. No, 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 no. So a composite fermion liquid is a is is different from a Fermi liquid of electrons. So for instance, composite fermion is gapped. The electron is gapped in this phase. Or if you take a correlation function of electron operator, electron operator, it, in space, it decays exponentially. Yes. In this. No, no, I'm, 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 but I'm saying, so, if, so, uh, if you start the Fermi liquid of composite fermions, and then, and then slowly uh, take the mean field and, and well, pump maybe, it maybe, onto the Maybe a simple way to say it is that uh, the composite Fermi fluid that you work out through this mean field theory is non-Fermi liquid. 
it's Fermi liquid parameters are like you know f one is minus one. So mass is. Uh, so if you if you, so that's another that's another complication. If you if if you include fluctuations of the gauge field, uh, this Fermi liquid of composite fermions turns into a non-Fermi liquid. Now, if the interactions between electrons, the between original electrons, are Coulomb-like, then this is only a marginal non-Fermi liquid, and we believe that everything is under control. But indeed, as Una was saying. Now if, I, if I honestly start including the fluctuations of little a, then the specific heat of this state goes as T log T at low temperature. And the effective mass of composite fermions diverges as log T. Oh, very fun. Um, yeah. um, so there is a lot of work being done uh, in understanding all of this physics, but let me let me not delve into that. Uh, what I did want to what I did want to mention is that, you know, all of this all of this minima near one half, all of these plateau states, now can be understood as the integer quantum hole effect of composite fermions. Yes. But you're not. This is not physically equal to one half, right? You can't use this composite fermion equation. Yeah. 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 That's right. So, so what I'm what I'm saying is that uh, this nearby nearby plateau states can be understood as integer quantum hole effect of composite fermions. Now, if you sit exactly at nuclear one half, then there is no effective magnetic field acting on composite fermions, and we get a Fermi surface. Now, I think you might be asking, how do we get an incompressible state at nuclear one half? Is that yeah. Right. Physically, Right, right. So, so um, as as Una is remarking, uh, at nu equal one half, you know, in experiments there is no plateau, but at uh, nu equal five halves, which is somewhere, I don't know, here, um, there is a there is a plateau. That's the famous five half states. So, uh, uh, actually. This composite fermion uh, picture also gives a way uh, to understand incompressible plateau states already at uh, half filling. <coughs> and uh, those are understood in the following way. So let's sit exactly at nu equal one half, so that b effective equal to zero. So so far we discussed a state with gapless composite fermions. Uh, can we get a gap state? Can we get a plateau state with quantized hole conductivity? And the answer is yes. And the way you do that is you take these composite fermions on the Fermi surface, and we know that you know, ordinary Fermi liquids are often often become superconducting at low temperature. So can we have superconductivity? Not really superconductivity, but effective superconductivity of these composite fermions. Or more precisely, can we have pairing of composite fermions? Can we get a pair condensate like this? Now remember, these composite fermions are spinless fermions. Right, we started with spin spinless electrons and we've turned them into spinless composite fermions. So if I have spin polarized fermions, uh, they can only pair in odd angular momentum channel. For instance, they can do P plus IP pairing. It turns out that if you do this, right, then your composite fermions become gapped. You get a gapped state. And this gap state is precisely a plateau state, is an incompressible state. And this is actually precisely the famous Pfaffian state.
if you pair composite fermions in angular momentum channel L equal 1, you get the Fabian state. And uh, now you can think of this state as an effective superconductor of composite fermions. And remember, in, su in a superconductor, we have vortices. And vortices trap flux. So in this case, they trap flux of this gauge field little a. Well, what is, you know, how much flux does a vortex in a superconductor trap in a paired, if you pair, uh, if you just have a superconductor with pair condensation, well, they trap flux pi, or, you know, h or 2e. But remember that the flux Flux pi, remember flux of this gauge field little a, transforms into electron number. So these um, vortices are going to trap precisely charge one quarter. Physical electric charge one quarter. So these are the famous E over 4 anions of the Fafian state. Moreover, we know that. Um, Vortices in a people as IP superconductor trap Majorana zero modes. Yes? Sorry, did, it, did you say how we have a superconductor? What did we do? So we, we pair condense composite fermions in. How did we do that? Kind of, we just assume that they pair We do a mean field. That's, so there is one state which is a gapless state where the composite fermions are not paired. You know, that's physically we believe that at nu equal one half that's the state being realized. But at five halves, for instance, which is again a half field Landau level, we have an incompressible state. So we need some other story for that state, but maybe we can we can still use composite fermions to describe it. So you assume the case for Landau and the condensate. Like to to actually have the condensate you have to have a case for Landau kind of equation. Yes, you can have a phase transition, but you don't have to think, you know, just microscopically what happens in a superconductor. Fermions pair. So here I'm going to say composite fermions pair. Sure. So experimentally, as you lower the temperature, then the phase it condenses and then it becomes incompressible. So actually, there is no phase transition because actually it's not real superconductivity, it's pairing. Uh, but because you have this. Uh, Gauge field around, turns out that fluctuations of that gauge field, you know, even though in mean field treatment you are going to find a phase transition, if you include fluctuations of this gauge field, they, at least in two dimensions, they'll get rid of that phase transition. Then what is the condition of having, actually trans, uh, of having a transition into this incompressible state? So, so what, you know, another, another situation, so, so there are two phase transitions you can think about. You can think about a finite temperature phase transition, and there is no finite temperature phase transition. Um, yeah, actually, in, at least, yeah, let's, under certain assumptions, there is no finite temperature phase transition. But you can also talk about zero temperature phase transition. Yes. So you can, you know, you can, you can imagine that, um, let's see if I can have that. Let's imagine that you tune interaction between your electrons a little bit. That was my question. You know, and uh, then you can, you can imagine that you go between this HLR, this compressible gapless phase with a Fermi surface, to a phase where composite fermions pair, and you develop a gap for the composite fermions, say the Fafin. And this is a very interesting quantum phase transition, which is a subject of a paper that I have written recently. So you can look it up. It's, it's a lot of fun, actually. Um, yes? In okay, an experiment, you're tuning B field, isn't it? Right, so in so an experiment, there is no, you know, experimentally, we are talking really, you know, this compressible state turns to be, seems to be realized at one half, and the incompressible state is at five halves, and they are really far away, so there is no direct transition between them experimentally. That's for the, you know, conventional TUDAG. Now, you could imagine other systems, like, for instance, bilayer graphene, where there are, you know, for instance, by applying an electric field perpendicular to the system, you can kind of effectively change the interactions in the, in the lowest Landau level. 
Uh, and there you can imagine that actually without changing the B field, but by changing some other crank, like the electric field, you can, uh, you can drive a direct transition. But so far, so far it hasn't been seen. Numerically, numerically by playing by, with V, you can indeed drive this phase transition. So am I understanding it correctly that still there is no, um, we, we don't see the direct connection between B and the B field, the, the interaction of the B field. So here you are saying that when you change the interaction, you can go from HLR to Fabian. But in an experiment for a Tuesday, you're actually tuning B field. Sure. So is there a direct connection that we can see very good. So you're saying why at one half we have HLR experimentally and at five halves we have Fafian. Is, is that the question you're asking? Yeah. Yes. So it turns out that you know if you have very strong B field, really you should <coughs> That's a very good question. So, at, in, in very strong B field, you can just, suppose you have the lowest Landau level half filled. So then, uh, because this, of this cyclotron gap, you can really forget about all the high Landau levels, and you can just project your problem into the lowest Landau level. Um, and then you get, then your interaction reduces to so-called Haldane pseudopotentials, which is essentially a projection of the Coulomb interaction onto the orbitals of the lowest Landau level. Now, you know, at five halves, really, so this is filled, and then there is another level, you know, really electrons have spin. So one half is, you know, say spin up, half filled, and three halves is also when spin down is half filled. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's still lowest Landau level. And then, you know, if you have five halves, then say it's again spin up, being half filled, but now in the n equal one Landau level. So now you know at five halves, n equal five halves, you can forget about these two lowest Landau, you know these two n equal zero Landau levels for up and down, which are completely filled, or at least you know you hope, you pray that you can do that. In the large enough magnetic field, you certainly can do that. And just think about the n equal one. Landau level of a spin up, which is now half filled. But now it turns out that if you project into the n equal 1 Landau level, you have to use the orbitals of electrons in the n equal 1 Landau level. And those orbitals are different from orbitals in the n equal 0 Landau level. So effectively, the interactions in the n equal 1 Landau level are different from n equal 0 Landau level. And that's why we believe that you know, 1 is a, 5 halves is a plateau state, and 1 half is a compressible state. Other questions? You were going to show us what happens for quarter. Quarter. I, I, I don't think I have a okay. picture here, but uh, in, I can show you during the break. So essentially, same, um, same story. Three, three, qu three quarter. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe you can, you can spot. Yeah, so, 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 so you see there is like a little dip here. That's the, that's the three quarter. That's a gauge freedom, but there is also some physical difference between them. So, you know, say in Landau gauge, right, you are just, you know, essentially your wave functions are this uh, harmonic oscillator wave function. Yeah. And, you know, n equals zero is like the ground state harmonic oscillator, and n equal one is the first excited state harmonic oscillator, and those are different wave functions. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, they're not gauge, they're not gauge equivalent, those two wave functions. Yes, but what if I use another gauge? Do I get the same one? So, so there is physical, there is physical distinction between the zeroth Landau level and the first Landau level. For instance, they have different energies, right? Yeah. So clearly, they cannot be just gauge transforms of each other. 
Um, good. Very good. Uh, so it looks, uh, yeah, so, so I'm almost out of time for the first, well, I guess I can have 10 more minutes probably, right? Um, so, uh, you know, it looks like uh, um, this composite fermion liquid uh, theory due to Halpin, Lee, and Reed is extremely successful, you know, lots of, lots of experiments explained by it, conceptually very nice, but turns out that there are a couple of problems with it. And uh, I'd like to focus on one particular problem. Um, As I was already mentioning, you know, we have these Landau levels. <coughs> and uh, really, we can take the cyclotron, by, by taking a large magnetic field, we can take the cyclotron frequency to infinity. And then, you know, I can really forget, if I'm sitting at half filling, I can really forget about the higher Landau levels, and I can just all of my physics takes place in the you know in the in the in, in the half field Landau level in a single Landau level. Uh, so in particular, you know, I can take my uh, electron operators, and I can project them onto the Hilbert space of this lowest Landau level. You know, I can write them as some some i c i phi i of x, where phi i of x are some set of orbitals um, of um, the lowest Landau level. Uh, here I'm using second quantized notation now. Psi is a second quantized fermion operator. Um, very good. So, um, good. So now, and the Hamiltonian, after projection, you know, the kinetic term is gone because, you know, just completely degenerate Landau level. And then I just have d to x, one half. So this was my initial interaction term. And this is, yeah, so this is my uh, interaction term. And now I simply project this onto the lowest Landau level. That is, I, you know, instead of, instead of keeping all Landau levels in the decomposition, I only use the lowest Landau level, phi, phi i zero, let's call it here. Okay, so interaction, Hamiltonian is just interaction. Yes? What is the uh, commutation relation after you drop the other operator? Very good. So they do not they do not actually commute. Right? So rho of x after the projection into the lowest Landau level. The densities do not commute. That's why this problem is not a trivial problem. You cannot just, you know, simultaneously, simultaneously diagonalize. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Okay, that's nice. So, what is the problem? The problem is that uh, once I've done this projection, I get an ex the, the, the theory has an extra symmetry, at least at half filling. And that symmetry, what that symmetry does, it maps particles to holes in the lowest Landau level.
So this symmetry so takes this operator CI and maps them to CI there. So if I have my Landau level, you know, and imagine you know, these orbitals here are filled and uh, maybe these ones here are also filled. Then under particle hole, the filled ones become empty and the empty ones become filled. So, for instance, if I had a completely empty Landau level, so nu equals zero, I get a completely filled Landau level, nu equals one. Now, an important point about this symmetry is that it's an anti-unitary symmetry. That is, not only you know, does it take ci to ci dagger, but it also takes i to minus i. So it acts also by complex conjugation on real numbers. So Sorry, is i, I is the square root of minus 1. Oh. Not the, oh, <laughs> because there are too many i's. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so, so uh, you know, if I take my electron operator, projected into the lowest Landau level, you know, ci is going to be taken to ci dagger, but phi i is going to be taken to phi i is just a number, phi of x, so it's going to be taken to phi i star. So remember that dagger of psi e is sum over i ci dagger for i non of x star so particle hole takes psi e of x into psi e dagger of x so electron density, so now everything is projected into the lowest Landau level. I will not write projection explicitly. Electron density under particle hole case. psi e dagger of x psi e of x. This goes into psi e of x psi e dagger of x, which is nothing but b over 2 pi minus where b over 2 pi is just the density of the completely filled Landau level. b over 2 pi minus rho e of x. So, you know, if I measure density with respect to the half filling, then on the particle hole, the electron density changes size. I'm going to take out these projection operators because everything is assumed to be projected. Now really, you know, if I add minus b over 4 pi here, you know, that only gives like a single body term, which, just, which is like just some chemical potential. And um, you know, I can always choose my chemical potential to give the filling that I want. So let me, let me not worry about that. So let me write out interactions like this.
right? They just add some constant and a term which is psi dagger psi, which is just like a chemical potential term. So now I see that my Hamiltonian is actually invariant under this particle hole symmetry. Now the particle hole symmetry gives a minus sign here, minus sign it's expert. here, and overall plus. Yes? For the two operators of the right, can you switch their order? Uh, which two operators? The side there. Well, that's what I. That's what I did here. No, no but originally it's psi dagger, psi, psi dagger. Oh yes. D did you want to say that it should be psi dagger, psi dagger, psi, psi? Mm -hmm. Is this your worry? Uh, is that yeah, originally it's psi dagger, psi, psi dagger? Oh, sorry, psi dagger, psi, psi dagger. Right. Where, where is? Uh, Psi dagger psi, psi dagger psi. Density, density. In the, in the Which line? Sorry. In, in the line on other platform. Here? There are three platforms. Three? You want this one? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so it's best to do it in terms of just, you know, we already, everything is already projected into the lowest Landau level, and this operator CI have have, you know, standard anti-commutation relations. So if you just, you know, you take psi E of X, psi E dagger of X, and you anti-commute them, you know, the you get, you, you get the minus sign uh, and you get phi i of 0 times phi i star of 0. That's just sum of you know, densities over the entire, all the orbitals. That's just the density of the field, completely filled Landau level. And that's, you know, you can check that that's b over 2 pi. Um, anyway, that constant is not going to play a big, big role. OK, so, so we have this uh, particle, particle hole symmetry. Um, Good, good, good. And uh, you know, obviously, under this particle hole transformation, the filling changes. So generally, if I have a filling nu, it goes to a filling 1 minus nu. But 1 half is left invariant. If I'm half filled and I change particles into holes, I'm still half filled. So at half filling, I have this symmetry. And this symmetry should be implemented in the effective theory. But turns out that uh, if you look at the halpin lee theory, this symmetry is not manifest and, in fact, is, is broken. Uh, so then the question is how to fix it up. And uh, I guess we have to take a break now, but let's come back to that in the second half. OK, so we'll take a break in a minute. Any final question before that? Or we could Um, so before, when we brought up the Fafian state, have we actually shown that the Fafian state will have a plateau, or is that, is that coming up soon? Uh, so we, we haven't talked about that. Uh, so the reason the Fafian state has a plateau is the following, that Basically, more or less all we have to show is that it's a gapped state, right? So once it's a gapped, you know, the, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's an insulator, so there is no dissipative transport. And uh, just by Galilean invariance, you know that it's at half filling, it's going to have a whole conductivity equal to one half. So then you est basically establish a plateau state. So we only have to show that it's gapped. But if you pair the composite fermions, Right? If you pair them with p plus ip pairing, um, and we just you know do something like Bogolub of Dijon, um, then you know all the all of them are going to have a energy 
is e of k basically you know, v f k minus k f uh, squared plus delta of k squared. So if you've for p plus ip, delta of k is kx plus iky times some delta naught, you know, maybe over kf, uh, just to normalize. So then, you know, delta of k squared is non-zero everywhere on the Fermi surface. So there is a gap everywhere on the Fermi surface. So it's gap. Okay. Now, you know, now the other thing to worry about is the gauge field, right? Because there is also a gauge field around uh, this little a. So far, we only treated it at mean field level, but generally, this gauge field is going to fluctuate. And actually, in the HLR state, that gauge field is gapless. Uh, that's why the state is compressible, because density in the HLR is basically the flux of the gauge field. So gauge field better be gapless in HLR for it to be compressible, which it is. Uh, now, so we also have to get rid of the gauge field. But actually, gauge field goes away for a very, uh, um, for the same reason um, that it does in a superconductor, right? So if you pair psi k, psi minus k, um, that breaks the U1 symmetry where psi goes e to the I, I alpha psi. So in a superconductor, you know, because you have electrons apart, there is a Meissner effect for the external magnetic field. Similarly, in this composite, so, so Meissner effect really means that the gauge field, electromagnetic field, is gap. Now, uh, if you take this composite fermion fluid and you pair composite fermions, it's this little a gauge field that's going to become gapped because of the Meissner effect. So we get rid of both, so everything is gapped. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.